I need to look manly by eating meat. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Business Plays. My glasses are really dirty. <laughs> these remind me of the things you get from KFC. Why do I pay for these? I should just steal these from KFC. <laughs> Amazon failures. Credited Danny, he wrote this script. I will read it, I will comment upon it, let's dive in. It's perfectly understandable why one of the biggest and most successful companies in the world might like to brush any occasional flops and misfires under the carpet and pretend they never happened. Unless you're Henry Ford, or certain politicians, in which case, just claim that everything you do, even if it is a flop or a failure, just claim that it's a huge success. Do see our video on Donald and Henry Ford, Fordlandia, for more on that one. Amazon for got off the ground when founder Jeff Bezos first started Bezos Bezos. I feel like I should know how to pronounce the, the surname of the richest man in the world. <laughs> Amazon first got off the ground when founder Jeff Bezos started flogging books online from his garage in Washington. It's now the biggest e-commerce platform on the planet, so you could easily forgive Jeff. And I'm going to call him by his first name because Bezos sounds too weird on his own. I mean, thank you, Daddy, you're so considerate. Uh, for wanting to highlight the staggering success story of his business instead of justifying the odd failure from time to time. But, in fact... Jeff has a refreshingly honest attitude to his failures. He's more than happy to talk about losing billions of dollars on ventures that went horribly wrong. It's all factored into his grand master plan, and he sees no shame in taking big risks that sometime go sometimes go down like a lead balloon. In his own words, as a company grows, everything needs to scale, including the size of your failed experiments. If the size of your failures isn't growing, you're not going to be inventing at a size that can actually move the needle. That's quite a relief to hear, as Amazon has certainly had its fair share of turkeys, duds, and disasters over the years. But it's good to know that at least Jeff... Jeff Bezos. Danny, you said you're going to refer to him as Jeff. Come on! But it's good to know that at least Jeff isn't losing too much sleep over any of them. Here are four of Amazon's most spectacular washouts. The Fire Phone. I remember this one. You'd think that a company like Amazon would have been on pretty safe ground with the release of a new mobile phone. They'd already struck success with Kindle devices, tablets, and streaming media players. Streaming media players? Amazon a streaming media player? An Amazon smartphone seemed like the next logical move. Launched in a big noise of marketing hype in 2014, Jeff Bezos. God damn it, Dan. Jeff described the new handset as gorgeous, elegant, and refined. Look, I'm going to throw up a pic because I don't remember what this looks like. I'm going to throw, and remember, this is, you know, it's all fair to say, like, you know, the Nokia 3310. Not exactly a piece of art. But at the time, I remember thinking that is futuristic. This was only five years ago, as of making of this video. And I don't know, what iPhone was out five years ago? Let's just say the iPhone 6. The iPhone 6 is a great looking phone. That is not. Uh, so yeah, not gorgeous, elegant, and refined, Jeff. One of the big selling points was the four cameras on the front of the device, which worked in unison to create a dynamic perspective. I remember this. This is where it would like, you could do the like, the tilting the phone and you could look at it in different ways. It was cool. This essentially meant that a parallax effect, yep, was added to your photographs, creating depth and a cool three-dimensional look to all of those images. So you could show off your plate of spaghetti bolognese in that trendy new restaurant. Yeah, I mean, it is cool, but what's the point? <laughs> a similar effect could be applied. Someone re recently told me that, you know, when you take a live photo on your iPhone, a PSA here, apparently it records sound, and people have been caught out, like, saying shit, like, on their live photos and then sending it to friends or family. Uh, I've not had anything embarrassing happen to me. The world we live in today, I've just generally started assuming that everyone at some point will read my emails or will be able to, or, like, look at all my photos. A similar effect could be applied to products available on the Amazon website, allowing you to render that luminous green mankini in glorious 3D before committing to buy. Wow, deep pull, Danny. Is that from Borat? Yes. Initially available at the high-end price of $200 with a two-year contract. What has happened? Was really $200 the high-end price of a phone just five years ago? Because I'm looking at that new iPhone 11, or whatever they're calling it. That like a grand. However, it only took a few months for the price to tumble quite dramatically to 99 cents, and Amazon still couldn't shift them. Danny, if that's if that's like a quite dramatic tumble, I really do wonder what a, an actual tumble is. Like, what's a real dramatic tumble? Because that's like a 200-fold price drop. By the following year, Amazon had quietly ceased production of the Fire Phone as a loss of 170 million dollars. And I mean, Amazon's got a lot of money. That's brutal. The I would buy with 170 million dollars. 
<laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll definitely buy a plane. But that's not enough money to have your own plane. Uh, the average net worth of someone who has a private jet, a billion dollars. I looked it up the other day because I was on a particularly rough flight. And I was like, hmm, how rich do I have to be to have my own plane? <laughs> Turns out to not that. Yeah, no, I'm not. So what's the problem? Well, firstly, Amazon surprised the market by asking top tier prices. With Kindle tablets and Fire TV, Amazon had developed a reputation for providing good value at below average prices. This stuff, it wasn't just good, it was relatively cheap. Yeah, Kindle's like 100 pounds, and it's amazing. <laughs> the high end prices of the Fire Phone suggested that there was something jaw droppingly amazing about Amazon's new smartphone. It's got four cameras on the front. And well, there really wasn't. It looked a bit cheap and a bit nasty. Sorry, Jeff, it did. The 3D stuff was technically very impressive, but ultimately a bit of a pointless gimmick. The general verdict was that Amazon had turned up far too late to the party and with an overly expensive product that really wasn't delivering anything new or useful. Yeah, it's kind of... It didn't look very good. Not so much a raging fire this time around, more a very damp spark. I don't know, I'm an iPhone person. I had that Samsung, whatever it was. I don't know, whatever last year's was. It wasn't very good. Askville. Amazon have made some very shrewd investments over the year, but they've made a few f ones. Back in 1999, they invested millions into the first round funding of the doomed Pets.com, at one point only 54% share of the company. Pets.com was a website, because we did a video on the dot-com boom, which you should check out. Uh, they were just selling stuff, it was like they'd buy it for like $100, they'd sell it for $50, and it's like, wow, we're so successful and have so many customers. Of course you do Pets.com. Your biggest customer is probably like Pets R Us or whatever. At the same time, the CEO of Pets.com Com, Julie Wainwright described the business alliance as a marriage made in heaven. She may have a very unusual take on marriage in heaven as Pets.com ended up becoming one of the most high profile casualties of the dot com bubble when it burst just a year later in 2000. Yeah, that was, it's worth. The dot com bubble is probably one of my favorite videos we've made so far. I'd recommend checking it out. In that same year, Amazon invested over $60 million in Cosmo.com, as I'm guessing this isn't the magazine because it's spelled with a K, uh, an online venture which was widely predicted to be going places. The business offered free one hour delivery of DVDs, games, and books by bicycle, car, truck, and very probably skateboard. I'm guessing that's a little bit of sarcasm there. Business insiders, although you know those uh, Uber Eats guys or whatever, I can imagine when I, <laughs> I saw an Uber Eats guy on the bus. I was like, dude, you can't even get a bike? That food is gonna be so cold. Business insiders warned from the very start that the free delivery approach was never going to be financially viable for the company. Well, yeah, it's free, where's the money? And it seems that they were proved right, as Cosmo did eventually start ch charging delivery rates, but it was too late to save the company from going under, taking Amazon's $60 million investment with it. Yeah, free delivery is awesome, but not like free delivery in one hour. If that ever becomes a thing, that will be amazing. Like sometimes Sometimes there's, uh, you can get like courier deliveries where it's like, yeah, we'll drop it off in 60 minutes. I've never done it because it's like $10. But it is nice to know that I could. However, one of the strangest Amazon investments came six years later when they launched Askville.com in 2006. Perhaps not fully learning the lessons from the Cosmo failure, this was another partnership with Cosmo co-founder Joseph Park, who this time had come up with a new idea for a user-driven question-and-answer website in which visitors could ask and respond to burning questions of the day, such as, do lesbians eat vegetables? I got two things to say here. Joseph Park, whoever you are, you are an incredible salesman. You managed to sell two businesses which ultimately failed horrifically and asked questions like, do lesbians eat vegetables? And you managed to sell them both, or like a significant chunk to Amazon? I would, I'd like you to work in sales for me, Joe. That's incredible. Now, I can't believe that someone actually asked that, so I'm gonna definitely Google... Weirdest Google search of the week! Do lesbians eat vegetables? Oh, there are results. The first one. The first one's from Reddit, though. Ask Reddit. Not really, it's from the Reddit sub forum, Insane People Cora. <laughs> Someone did ask it on Askville. Surely this has got to be a joke. Someone asked it on Cora.com. Do lesbians eat vegetables? For example, I have a lesbian friend who doesn't like to eat vegetables, as she says she is worried she will come across as weak and inferior in front of men who she feels oppress her on a regular basis. <laughs> is she living in the 1930s? <laughs> I need to look manly by eating meat. <laughs> I'm wondering, is the genetic gene responsible for lesbianism somehow mutated in recent generations to cause them to eat a more masculine diet? Dude, are you living in the 1930s? It seems to be like asked seriously. Oh my god. 
The top comment on Reddit. These are always good for a laugh. It's true. When I eat vegetables, my lesbian powers slowly drain away before I eat an entire cow to regain my HP. What are we talking about? Oh yeah, Askville. The concept itself wasn't too bad, and it's a format which sites such as Cora later transformed into thriving communities. But the Askville approach was a bit cringeworthy. Figuring that the platform needed to be more than just questions and answers to get people engaged, they came up with a cutesy gamification model in which users could gain or lose experience points depending on the quality of their answers. I remember it seemed like five years ago everything was gamified. <laughs> like, I sometimes hire people. I think I hired Danny through the website freelancer.com and it'd be like, hi, you, you hired someone, congratulations, get 100 points. And it's like, you're freelancer i'm trying to do some goddamn business i don't need it's like yeah i'm gonna hire more because i'm getting experience points jeez users were even encouraged to earn quest gold which could be redeemed for amazon gift cards or products from the askville store amazon gift cards would interest me <laughs> In the end, the overcomplicated idea just didn't take off at all, leaving the message boards largely empty and useless. One of the final questions posed on the site before the boards were closed forever was, why does Amazon bother supporting AskBill.com? Burn! The war of the words between Amazon and Apple. Imagine that you're experiencing the Kindle app on your Android phone. You browse through a selection of potentially tempting book titles. You eventually reach a decision about which book you're going to read next. You click the big friendly buy now button and the book is instantly downloaded to your device. Perfectly simple and simply perfect. This is how apps were meant to function. Danny, you should write copy. <laughs> like uh, sales copy for Amazon. That's, you know, Perfectly simple and simply perfect. The app. I should do the voiceover. Hang on. <clears throat> the Kindle app on your Amazon phone. Perfectly simple and simply perfect. This video is brought to you by. <laughs> but now let's imagine that you're exploring the Kindle app on your iPhone. You browse through a selection of potentially tempting book titles. You eventually reach a decision about which book you're going to read next. Twilight number four. <laughs> and you click the big friendly buy now button and. Well, no, you have to actually have to stop there because you can't do that. There is no big friendly buy now button because in quite absurd turn of events, you can't buy books from within the iOS version of the Kindle app. Oh, I thought this was just something wrong with mine. <laughs> yeah, I stopped doing this because I was like, I couldn't buy books. I had to log on to my Amazon.com or uh, .co.uk account, buy a book and then sync it with my phone. I just assumed mine was broken. The problem kicked off when Apple first started demanding that developers hand over a 30% cut of all purchases made from within their apps. Amazon weren't happy about this. You can't blame them, really, as they already needed to factor in author royalties from every ebook sale, and they reckoned that giving Apple a 30% cut just wasn't going to work. Unfortunately, the two corporate giants they failed to reach an agreement. Amazon originally tried to sneakily evade the app toll by including links in the Kindle app to their browser-based Kindle store so that book purchases weren't technically made from within the app. But when Apple tightened the rules further and banned external purchase links, iPhone users were left in this maddening situation where ordering a book from Kindle involves browsing the app, exiting the app, finding the browser version of the Kindle store, buying the book and go then going back to the app. Yes, it's a pain in the ass. The only reason I tolerate it is because I read really slowly and maybe I need a new book like once every six months. Ridiculously complicated and perfectly ridiculous. Amazon Kindle on your iPhone. Ridiculously complicated perfectly ridiculous. This video! Of course, we can't pin all of the blame on- can't they just reach an agreement? Just, like, you guys, or your huge companies, just be like, okay, well, you know, we understand that you want some money, we don't want to give you 30%, why don't we just settle on 10? And then Amazon are like, how about 20? And then they come back and they're like, 15? But considering that the Kindle app was originally designed to be a platform for buying and reading books, the iOS version is currently one of Amazon's longest running failures, and it falls completely flat on exactly half of its mission. I have to say, recently, I've actually stopped doing that altogether, because I discovered Scribd, uh, who are actually a sponsor of one of our other channels, but this is not a sponsored message. They're genuinely genuinely fantastic. Like, you could just read any book you want for, it's like eight bucks a month. Tons of audiobooks, tons of books, magazines as well. It is glorious. Amazon Destinations. Finally, here is a short-lived venture that was heavily tipped for success, but was pulled so quickly that you may have missed out on it if you blinked. Yeah, I've never... Amazon did holidays? Never... I assume holidays. Never heard of this. Amazon Destination was the company's entry into the hotel booking industry, offering weekend retreats and idyllic getaways at standard listed prices. What other, what other sorts of prices are there? 
Their hotel partners were very enthusiastic about the new partnership, reporting increased traffic and bookings after signing up with Amazon's new service. The prices weren't exactly special deals or discounts, but the main idea was that Amazon's huge online presence could help get the hotel standard listings beamed onto the screens of a much wider audience than before. Honestly, like sales and stuff and holiday stuff, when it's a service, I'm always like, is it really a sale or is that the real price? Yeah, you can stay at this amazing hotel. Normally, $700 a night. Now, just $79. And I'm like, if this... If this $79 room is as nice as the $700 room? I don't even know why I say that. It's not gonna be. <laughs> Widely predicted to eventually become a major player in the online travel agency market, Amazon seemed to be on the right tracks with this new venture. But then a few months later, Amazon destinations just mysteriously disappeared from the internet as if it had taken a disastrous detour into the Bermuda Triangle. Now, nobody really understands why, as Amazon were uncharacteristically coy about the whole subject. That's not like you, Jeff. You talk about your failures. We can speculate that the increased growth of the other major OTAs, uh, online travel agents, such as Expedia, was having a negative impact on Amazon's fresh venture. What, like competition? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's what you gotta do, you gotta compete. You can't just be like, well, I went to the market, why didn't everyone just give up? I'm Amazon! Uh, some business experts insist that a truly successful operator must be wholly dedicated to the service, instead of it just being one of the many diverse services in a company's portfolio. What sort of business expert is that? <laughs> Those business experts are not people I would hire. I mean, I get, I'm sure, you know, if Simon was in to enter to the travel agency world, it would be quite tricky. But if Elon Musk was, he'd probably be like, it's not very hard, is it? I mean, it's like, yeah, you could, look, look Elon, you can only be doing travel agency, uh, I run an electric car company, a solar panel company, I dig holes underneath cities for cars. Oh yeah, and I have a f***ing space agency. Amazon won't release the figures from this failed experiment, so we'll never fully understand why Amazon destinations seem to crash so quickly. Maybe somebody should pose the question on askphil.com. Bada bum bum the good news is that Amazon are already geared up for a future of more failures. In fact, Jeff almost... Danny, you said you're going to refer to him as only Jeff, and then you proceed to refer to him as Jeff Bezos every time, and it trips me up. Come on, Danny. You can do better. It's okay. You just have to admit your failures. In fact, Jeff almost seems to be relishing the idea of losing billions and billions of dollars. When asked about the failure of the Fire Phone, he quipped, If you think that's a big failure, we're working on much bigger failures right now, and I'm not kidding. I like that. I have to say, like, whenever I see, <laughs> as much as I'm making fun of Jeff Bezos today, I have a huge amount of respect and admiration for Jeff Bezos. He is an absolute machine. In a recent annual shareholder letter, Jeff warns that Amazon will be experimenting at the right size for a company of our size if we occasionally have multi-billion dollar failures. Of course, we won't undertake such experiments cavalierly. Cav cav cavalierly? Is that? I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm not gonna look it up. We will work hard to make good bets. But not all good bets will ultimately pay out. I can't wait to see what spectacularly glorious failures Amazon has lined up over the next few decades. Mostly so that I can make Amazon Failures Part 2. Assuming the business place is not one of Simon's failures. We will see. Right now, we had about a thousand views an episode, which is not bad. It's not really up to scratch. I should promote this more. Speaking of promoting this, subscribe, hit that like button, hit that bell when you do subscribe so you get alerted when a new video like this comes out currently three times a week. Because when I do a failure, I go all in. And that's it. I'll see you next time.